love it when Lee leads our singing. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. I want to uh, apologize to you first of all uh, for the word boo birds, two words. I'm sorry, it's actually one word. Boo birds is actually one word, and I want to get to that in a moment. But first, I wanted to tell Gabriel Solis, happy 60th birthday. Gabriel is a great evangelist, personal evangelist. He, uh, you know, he believes Jesus is serious about everything he said. And you are certainly a great witness. Thank you, Gabriel. And happy 60th birthday to you. Also wanted to mention that Jared is out of town. He is in Searcy for Caruso. Uh, he is uh, helping with Caruso, which is a special summertime program for young men who want to become or become become preachers, teachers, or become more able to teach publicly in worship services, and he is helping those young men. Elijah King, one of our young men, has gone for the week, and we, are, we commend him to you for that, uh, for that initiative on his part. So pray for them all. And uh, boo birds. Did you like that word? Again, it's just one word, boo birds. Did you know that word came in about in 1934? It was first used in 1934. And in the free dictionary, it is a noun that is a person who habitually criticizes or jeers. The Merriam-Webster dictionary speaks of a boo bird as a home fan at a sporting event who boos one or more members of the home team. None of us have ever been guilty of that, have we, at Razorback Games? Never. <clears throat> My nose is growing. Anyway, the Collins English Dictionary calls it a boo bird, a person who habitually criticizes or jeers, or jeers. So if you ever see a crossword puzzle where it says, what do, they, what do bur bur boo birds serve up? It's jeers or criticism. I was surprised when I learned that that was a real word, and I didn't, I, I kind of, I, you know, you look at the first couple of things online, and you say, uh, say I'm not sure if that's a real one-word thing or not, but it really is one word, but it's a bird that goes boo. <laughs> anyway, it won't surprise you to know that boo birds are everywhere. They are, they boo at you, they discourage you, they nitpick at you, they criticize, they bite you sometimes, not literally, uh, unless, unless you work in a hospital sometimes, but anyway, uh, they, they bite you uh, with stinging remarks, boo birds are certainly at church, they criticize the sound, the singing, and the sermon. They're good people most of the time, but they feel it's their responsibility to uh, make their opinions known to the folks that they believe are underachieve, underachieving. Uh, sadly, those who hold re leadership responsibilities in church and virtually anywhere in our families, at work, are usually the targets of boo birds. Boo birds were certainly present at the construction of the temple in Jerusalem at the time that Ezra came around. Our text is going to be in Ezra chapter 4, and I want to give, kind of bring you up to speed on what happened. Boo birds were around when they started to do something, when Israel, Judah, tried to get things going again in Jerusalem. Now understand it's been about 50 years since Judah has been exiled by the Babylonians to be allowed to return back by the Persian king, Cyrus. So it's been 50 years, at least, I guess you'd call that two generations of people, maybe two and a half, but two generations of people had passed in a foreign land. There are psalms that mention how very unhappy they were in Babylonian captivity or exile. They had been yanked out of their homes. The only people that were left in Jerusalem were the poor folks and those who couldn't take care of themselves. So imagine 50 years in a city where basically nobody's mowed the yard. You get the picture? And nobody's taking care of their houses. Jerusalem is a mess, and the temple has been destroyed. It's been razed to the ground. 
And so that's the situation as it was when these Judeans, these Judah folks and Benjamin, those, those tribes moved back hundreds of miles to Jerusalem. We can learn some things, I think, from this text in Ezra about boo birds and how you deal with them. Uh, we can learn a lot about criticism and what that means and how we should respond to it. And let's just go to the text right now, Ezra chapter 4. I'm going to start by reading the first three verses. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let's help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Now, this sounds like a very harsh response to people who really just wanted to be helpful. Well, <laughs> uh, it might be a little misleading because you need to know a bit of the backstory here and why the leaders of Judah did not want any help from these people. Uh, there's, it's believed that this ties in with something that happened in 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, verse 24, 2 Kings 17, 24. I want to read this to you because I want you to know where these people came from and what their priorities were, okay? In 2 Kings 17, verse 24, the king of Assyria, that may be Esarhaddon, the one they were referring to earlier, brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. These are people who are Babylonians, Persians, and foreigners who know very little, if anything, about the God of heaven. They consider Yahweh, the Hebrew God, one of many gods, and here they are, they're basically pagan people. And they settled north of Jerusalem, which would be in Samaria. And probably that's part of the reason that there was such a hatred, a, a suspicion of Jews for Samaritans, was because of that pagan background. Go to verse 32. They worship the Lord, that means they worship Yahweh, but... They also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines at the high places. They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. And to this day, they persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. And then in verse 40, they broke the first commandment. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. They had lots of gods. In verse 40, it says they were told about this. And it says they would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do so, to do as their ancestors did. These are probably the people who were the resettlers, boo birds, or enemies. There is more to a text than meets the eye, and that's why we take a little extra time to look at this. Once you get the kind, once you get the kind of people uh, these are, once you understand who they are, you kind of get a picture of why they were so resistant to allowing these folks to have anything to do with the rebuilding of the temple. You know, during World War II, people in the United States and Germany were enemies, and we know that there were many in the resistance, Europeans who would work in German ordnance factories, and their job was not to build bombs, but to build duds. And a great many bombs were duds because of 
these folks in the resistance who came in with another agenda. They didn't intend to build bombs. The French and others in that area and the Flemish, the Belgians, they would not, they weren't building bombs. They were building duds. It kind of makes you wonder here if these folks weren't really interested in building a temple for the Lord, but maybe interested in sabotaging the work perhaps. I don't know if that was the intention of these boo birds, but they had not wanted to worship the Lord, the God Yahweh, all of those years that they had lived there before the resettlers came back. Do you know the only thing that these people had done that lived in the north, the Sumerians? All they'd done is exist and worship their gods, of whom God was a minor player. And it was their issue, not Israel's, not Judah's issue, that made them enemies. Why do we have enemies? We're, we are really told why the folks rebuilding the temple had enemies. But we can speculate that there are several good reasons why they had enemies. There was jealousy. They didn't like the special attention Judah was getting from the king of Persia. It could be insecurity on the part of these folks in the north. After all these years, these boo birds had never really tried to accomplish anything. They had never made God their one and only God. And maybe seeing a, a bunch of people so committed to the Lord God of heaven, the heavens and the earth, that it kind of scared them a little, that they weren't quite comfortable with the idea of having such dedicated neighbors to God, Yahweh, the God of all. And perhaps it's just they didn't like them. People don't like us. That's why we have enemies. We, people don't like us. People don't have to have a reason to dislike us. Folks just do. We might remind someone of someone from back in their childhood that mistreated them, had a bad experience with them, or looked at them funny. It, you don't have to have a good reason to dislike somebody or to dislike you. And often the great enemy Satan is very much behind this. If you do good, if you try to accomplish something worthy, something great, something to the glory of God, if you begin a walk with Jesus Christ, a serious walk with him, if you are baptized or you rededicate yourself to the Lord, be guaranteed that Satan will provide you with boo birds, people who will discourage you, people who will nitpick at you, who will tell you you're not who you ought to be. And sometimes Satan will even use a friend. Jesus was preparing to go to Jerusalem for that final week of his life where he would be tested in the most strenuous ways possible. As he prepared to go, he was trying to explain to his apostles you know, after all the miracles, after all the, after all the casting out of demons, after everything that Jesus had done, they had quite a following. Even though Jesus had told people, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, people were coming in hordes. He had, he had healed and fed, you know, he'd fed thousands of people on two different occasions. I mean, Jesus was drawing a big crowd. And then Jesus sat down and told the apostles plainly what was going to happen to him. And that happened in Mark 8, verse 31. He then began to teach them, speaking of the apostles, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. What kind of news is this? This is not good news for apostles. You're prophesying your own demise? Just when things are getting really good and hopeful? Thousands are following you and you're working signs and wonders? He spoke plainly about this, verse 32, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, I love this, Jesus turns, he looks at his disciples and he rebukes Peter, but he talks to Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. 
You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but, the cons but merely human concerns. Jesus spoke to the real enemy who was in, at that moment, using Peter. He said, you don't have God's concerns in mind. You only have human concerns in mind. You only have political power in mind. It would be so much easier to avoid the cross. But Jesus knew that Satan was using Peter's lap, laps to derail his mission. Peter was not his enemy. Peter was his closest friend. But Satan used him in a moment of weakness to discourage him or to try to discourage him. If Satan can use a friend to discourage you, he can sure, certainly use boo birds too. Remember in Ephesians 6 verse 12, who our real enemy is? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil. One translation puts it the cosmic powers of evil in the heavenly realms, those places that are unseen. So don't be surprised if you have enemies. You say, well, I'm trying to do the right thing and I have enemies. Well, that's doing the right thing and having enemies seem to go together sometimes. Let's look at Ezra 4, verse 4 now. We'll go back to the storyline. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, the king of, of Persia. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And here's the accusation, verse 12, as we skip through here, but here's the, here's the accusation. That the king, this king should know that the people who came up to us from you have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They're restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Furthermore, the king should know that if this city is built and its walls are restored, no more taxes, tribute, or duty will be paid. And eventually the royal revenues will suffer. Now since we're under obligation to the palace and it's not proper for us to see the king dishonored, we're sending this message to inform the king. Such high motivation, huh? So that a search may be made in the archives of your predecessors. In these records you will find that this city is a troublesome city. Troublesome to kings and provinces. A place with a long history of sedition. That is why this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is built and its walls are restored, you will be left with nothing in Trans-Euphrates. Trans-Euphrates would be west, west, that way, west of the Tigris-Euphrates Fertile Crescent where the capital city of Persia was. That's like a thousand plus miles. I think they were exaggerating a little bit, almost certainly. Um, but here's what the accusation looks like. These folks are not good people. It's funny how these ideas get in people's heads about you, the boo birds, don't think you're good people. You say, why? It seems to be human nature. But what had the settlers ever done to aggravate these people other than move back? I mean, sometimes you don't have to have a reason to have enemies. Uh, often people just don't have any reasons at all to make your life hard. They just seem to get some sick satisfaction from doing it. The second thing is they will undermine your authority and ability to tax. That was the second of the criticisms. What? Where did they get that idea? Or, or is it their past history? Ever feel like you can't escape from your past mistakes? Someone's going to always bring them back up. Some folks never let you live down your errors. And then the, other, then the other criticism was they will dishonor the king. Why in the world would they say that? They had been nothing but obedient servants the whole time, at least recently. And then the exaggeration. 
Nothing east of the Euphrates River will belong to you anymore. Nothing like fear-mongering to frighten a king. And the fear is about the political power and the money that they thought they were going to lose by letting them rebuild Jerusalem. Let's talk about our enemies for a moment. I think it's important. Of course we're supposed to love our enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 44, we get a very clear view of what Jesus thinks about our enemies and how we should treat our enemies. In 543, we read, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He goes on to say that so that you can be the children of God in heaven. Love and pray for your enemies. That does not mean that your enemies get to interfere with your work, your calling, or your priorities. Children of God, we need to hear this. Loving your enemies doesn't mean you compromise what God is telling you to do. Your calling is your calling. Your priorities are your priorities. Don't let anybody else set your priorities or derail you from what God is calling you to do. Jesus is not teaching us to surrender what God is calling you and I to do, no matter what the boo birds say. Did Jesus love the Pharisees and Sadducees? Of course he did. On the cross, he forgave them. But he, did he allow them to derail his ministry? Absolutely not. Nor did he spend over much time arguing with these people. They seemed to dog him and test him. He didn't go out of his way to try to teach these people who didn't want to learn. He answered their questions because so often they were asking to test him. They weren't asking to learn. Your enemies will do that. Your enemies will ask and test you. Don't let God derail you. You can love your enemies and you can go on in spite of them too. Because your enemies will find very little good to say about you, no matter what good you do. And here's what the criticisms are. I want to kind of, as we say, circle back, okay? Here's number one criticism. You are not good. Your enemies don't think you're good. Because you lead somewhere or do something doing something out in front of somebody, taking a leadership responsibility, wherever that responsibility is, some will always say, you are so full of yourself, you are so proud, you're so narcissistic. You are not good. Others will say, well, you're not very good at what you do anyway. That's what your enemies say. You're an underachiever, and they will criticize you relentlessly. Why? Because you're not good. You're not spiritual. You're not godly. You're not humble. You're a show-off. All criticisms from enemies designed to discourage you. And when you hear that, that's not about you. That's about them. That's about them, not about you. Often I ask people to under, undertake certain ministries and quite often I get, the, I get the answer, well, I don't think I can. And they're just dying to try it, but they're afraid because they're afraid of what their detractors might say. The weapon is fear. It states in verse 4 of our text that the people set out to discourage the people and make them afraid to build. What's going to happen if we take the lead on this? What is going to happen if we actually do this? We've got enemies out there. This weapon is used by everybody who wants to discourage somebody. Fear. If you do this, you'll regret it. If you say this, you'll pay a price. Discouraging words kill creativity and Put out the Holy Spirit's fire. Be watchful of your enemies' opinions of you, but do not let them control you. They will try to make you afraid. 
When these boo birds wrote to the king, they warned him of terrible consequences to produce fear. And they used exaggerations as well. Listen to what they said. If you let Judah rebuild this temple, they will stop paying taxes. Where'd they get that from? It was the king, Cyrus, who told them they could go ahead and do it, gave them royal money to do this. And yet the accusation is they're not going to pay their taxes if you let them go ahead and do that. Or if you let Judah rebuild the temple, they're going to dishonor the king. They're going to dishonor you. Again, where did that come from? They were doing this at the behest of King Cyrus. They are already restoring the walls was another was another accusation. Did you notice that they're restoring the walls? They hadn't started on the walls yet. You get it? They were looking, they were grabbing at anything, at straws, even things that were blatantly untrue to try to discredit these people that were trying to do God's will. Well, the only work that had been done up to that time was they resettled the people, about 50,000 of them. They built an altars and they built a foundation, and that's all there was. And these people are worried that they're already starting on the wall, and they hadn't started on the wall. They hadn't even started on the temple yet. They would say anything to discourage Judah. That's the way of enemies. And their history was a weapon used against them. Enemies like to use your history. The problem with our history is it is dotted with failure. Every one of us has had failings. Every one of us. The enemies of Judah used their own failures against them. They are a rebellious people. And you know how they got into the fix they're in because they dishonored their God. Oh, that was true. That was true. Nothing hurts worse than a true recounting of your own history. <laughs> but you know, that didn't matter to God because God has mercy. It was God who told them to go build, to build that foundation. And even though the city of Jerusalem had been pretty much leveled and the temple destroyed because they had been rebels against God, all that true, God wanted them to rebuild out of his mercy, his hesed love, his steadfast love. But they said, they'll never be any more than they've always been. They're just a seditious, rebellious people. You heard that before? Perhaps that's come from a parent or a brother or sister. Or someone who hated you. Or maybe someone who used to be a friend. Or maybe out of your own heart. Sometimes our hearts are our own worst enemy. Our hearts slander us because we know that this is our worst fear. Is that we'll never be able to escape our history. Don't you listen because your heart's lying to you. Satan is lying to you through your heart. You are able to escape your history. You are able to become more than you ever imagined. Our history of failures and stumbles and darkness and the awful mistakes we've made, many of these mistakes we know were not just errors, errors in judgment, but were actual clear-eyed rebellion against God, and we knew it at the time, and we did it anyway. There's Nothing that makes us feel chained than the truth of our past. Perhaps you've been compromised. Your reputation as an honest person was destroyed. Maybe you have a terrible relationship with your children because of past failures. It's hard to come back from moral and ethical failures. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you it's easy, but I can tell you it's possible with God's grace. His Hesed love. If you let God help you, you can. You let him guide you, 
by the Holy Spirit. Trust in his forgiveness, the precious blood of Jesus we spoke of today. Jesus paid a very high price so that you might be delivered from your history. You know why we love the Apostle Peter. You know, he's the one that scolded Jesus for talking about going to the cross. Well, at least he spoke boldly when polling his disciples about who people thought he was. If you remember, Peter was the one who said, I believe you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, man, you, got, you hit it right on the nose and flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but the Spirit of God revealed that to you. Peter was the first one of the apostles to actually word that that way. And yet he was the first one to criticize Jesus for wanting to go to the cross. Because Satan used him in a moment of weakness and misunderstanding. But you know, nobody understood grace like Peter did because he wrote in, in this book, 1 Peter, his book, chapter 2, verse 10, he said, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy. Peter knew that. He had firsthand knowledge of that mercy. And he took it in and he wrote of it. He never forgot where he came from or who he was. He was informed by his history. But he was not discouraged by his history. And when the boo birds gathered, when Peter's own conscience must have convicted him time and time again, it was Christ's power that spoke to his need of grace and love and forgiveness. Craig Groeschel is a best-selling author and minister. In his book, Winning the War in Your Mind, I found this, very, this book is very useful. His wife, I, I've read the book, but you know, sometimes I don't read the preface and sometimes I don't read the afterword, you know, the, the, the afterword, the post log or whatever you want to call it. And I decided, I don't know why, I was just look, reading around and I, I found this in the afterword that is written by Amy Groeschel, who is Craig Groeschel's wife. Craig Groeschel is a very well known evangelical Christian and a very popular author and pastor. But let me listen, listen to what Amy writes about in her, about Craig. When people brag on my husband, they talk about his passion, his servant leadership, his gift of clearly communicating the gospel, and his self-discipline. I've been married to him for 30 years, and I can tell you firsthand, he really is a man pursuing God's heart and glory. But what people may not see is that Craig's admirable qualities are testimonies of an overcoming faith that has endured years of waging war against discouraging thoughts in his mind. Get that? She's confessing Craig's doubt and discouragement. Like many people, Craig has always been hard on himself, whether competing in a sport, preaching a sermon, or leading our family. He often was disappointed that he didn't do better. When people looked on and admired him, internally he was wrestling with thoughts like, I can never measure up, or I don't have what it takes. This is a best-selling author, a highly influential man in Christian circles, and deep, way down deep, his heart says, I don't measure up. You know, we think of people like this. They got it all together. They're confident. When he walks in a room, he has moments. No, he is, he is filled with self-doubt. You're not the only one. Sometimes your enemy is from within. He said, she said that, he's, that Craig is winning the battle over the boo birds in his own heart by two things. It's simple, by persistent daily Bible study and memorization. And secondly, daily, persistent, steady prayer. It's not magic. 
It's what we've always encouraged you to do, is to spend time with God every day. Well, I want to get back and finish the story. You know, it's really sad in Ezra chapter 4 that uh, the Judeans were actually forced to stop their work. The king actually bought into this. Xerxes said, eh, we got to stop the work. Too much fear, too, much, uh, too many words from enemies. It all concerned him and wasn't his priority anyway to make sure anybody was necessarily happy as long as he was happy. It's the way it is with enemies, as long as they're happy. But your walk with Christ is going to be opposed by easeful forces, so arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. There are only three ways you can lose to your enemy. And you find that in 1 John 4, verse 4. It says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. There are three ways you lose to your enemies. Number one, you quit because they discourage you. Secondly, you let them co-opt what you have called them to do, what God's called them to do. And thirdly, you don't love and pray for them. That those are the only ways that you lose to your enemies. You quit because you let them discourage you. Number two, you let them co-opt your mission to decide for you what you're supposed to be doing. And thirdly, you're not loving and praying for them because while you're doing this, you need to be in constant prayer and loving and caring for those boo birds out there. You need to claim your future. Pronounce your history washed because God has been gracious in giving the blood of his son to forgive you. Claim your ministry. Claim your freedom. Freedom from fear to the one who is within you who is greater than anyone on the outside of you. If you need to do that this morning, if you need to realign your navigation system spiritually. We're here to help you with that this morning. Perhaps you want to make a decision for Christ today. The water's ready. We can baptize you today. We can pray for you today. What is it that you need that we can help you with? That is our mission this morning, praising God and trusting his grace. As we stand and as Lee leads us, if you need to, please come. He leadeth.